Good morning. It's Tuesday, August 7, 2018. In yesterday's newsletter, I described how U.S. Olympic medalist Gertrude Ederle became the first woman to swim the English Channel. Today, I'm reminded of another female swimmer, and of an era when relations between Washington and Moscow were even more ominous than now. The year was 1987, the Cold War was four decades old and although the end was near, it didn't feel that way at the time. The United States possessed 23,500 nuclear warheads, the Soviet Union had a similar number. Leaders in both nations wanted to reduce those arsenals, and mutual tensions as well, but mistrust remained. Ronald Reagan was convinced the Russians were cheating on the SALT II limits. Mikhail Gorbachev considered Reagan's strategic defense initiative a violation of both the spirit and the letter of the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, and an unnecessary provocation. In this frosty environment, an American woman clad in only a bathing suit, slipped into 40-degree water in the Arctic Ocean to begin a solo swim across a forbidding stretch of the Bering Sea. The swimmer's name was Lynn Cox. Beginning her 2.4-mile journey in Alaska and finishing in Siberia, she was attempting to give Russians and Americans something they could root for together, namely, her success and survival. To give you an idea of just how frigid that water was, 40 degrees is about the temperature of ice water you drink in a restaurant. Sports trainers warn athletes that if they stay in 40-degree whirlpool baths for more than 12 minutes their muscles can sustain permanent damage. An average person who plunged into 60-degree water, 20 degrees warmer than the Bering Sea was on August 7, 1987, would begin experiencing hypothermia after several minutes and might go into shock. Lynn Cox was in the water for over an hour. Maybe it was only a symbol, or maybe it was an omen, or, just maybe, government officials staring at each other across the abyss of the Cold War were inspired by her. Gorbachev said as much later while having dinner with Reagan. I'll have more details on that amazing swim, which I wrote about five years ago, in a moment. First, I'd direct you to Real Clear Politics front page which presents our poll averages, videos, breaking news stories, and aggregated opinion columns spanning the political spectrum. We also offer original material from our own reporters and contributors, including the following, asterisk 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 state-level Democrats could ride a wave in November. Veteran political reporter Lou Cannon writes that state legislative elections held since Donald Trump became president point to a Democratic resurgence in offices dominated by Republicans. President Trump, please help save Chicago. RCP contributor Steve Quartz argues that that city leaders have shown themselves to be incapable of dealing with out-of-control street violence. Post-communist Russia is not the Soviet Union. Solzhenitsyn scholar Daniel J. Mahoney warns that the West should not confuse the old totalitarian government with Putin's authoritarian one. Renewing localism for the 21st century, in the latest installment of Real Clear Policy's American Project series, AEI's Ryan Streeter contends that localism offers the solution to our divided politics. Time to stop subsidizing Amazon. Also in RC Policy, fair marketplace advocate Robert B. Engel asserts that tax subsidies for the tech company hamper small businesses. As Venezuela dollarizes, monetarism's conceit collapses. Real Clear Markets editor John Tamney explains how money supply is an effective production, not of central bank planning. Critiquing the inequality alarmism of Thomas Piketty. Also at RCM, econpwr.com editor Quinn Connolly makes a case that living standards have surged amid the natural rise of wealth and equality. Why hasn't the U.S. Put a price on carbon yet, in real clear energy, DSM North America President Hugh C. Welsh applauds a new bill that would impose a tax on carbon. The right way forward on college completion, in real clear education, AEI's Frederick M. Hess and R.J. Martin explore new ideas for improving college graduation rates. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk if you passed Lynn Cox on the street in Seal Beach near where she lives or some other coastal town in Southern California, you might not notice her.
If you did, you'd probably expect the matronly-looking cox to climb into her minivan to ferry kids or dogs. The thought might occur to you that she could lose some weight. If that notion crossed your mind, you'd be wrong. You'd actually be in the presence of a world-class athlete. As a kid, Lynn was the slowest swimmer in her family. But there was always an X factor, she enjoyed swimming very long distances, often at night, or before the sun rose in the morning. Also, the colder and nastier the weather, the more she liked to be in the water. In part, this is made possible by her physique. Marathon swimmers do not typically possess the long and lean body types one sees on television every four years at the Olympics. Braving ocean currents four hours requires different physical attributes. But even among these human seals, Lynn Cox stands out. Her body fat is in the range of 30 to 35 percent. The average American woman is less than 25 percent, but the real anomaly is that her fat is evenly distributed. The effect is that of a natural wetsuit. That's the physical part. Lynn Cox's mental and spiritual makeup is even more extraordinary. In 1971, she was one of a group of four young athletes who swam the 20 miles from Catalina Island to the California mainland, and she was so far ahead of the others she had to tread water and wait for them to catch up. She was 14. The following year, Cox swam the English Channel in 9 hours and 57 minutes, breaking the women's record by 4 hours, and eclipsing the men's record by 30 minutes. In 1974, while still a high school student, she returned to Catalina, this time swimming alone, to demolish that record as well. As a student at UC Santa Barbara, Lynn began thinking of long-distance, open-ocean swimming in a different way. Even at Los Alamitos High School, swimming historian Charles Sprosson discovered, her teachers noticed her fascination with impossible things done in history by individual people. As a college student, she found a way to merge this fascination with her love of swimming. Cox began to imagine how her talents and her gifts could be used to bring people together. This lesson was brought home to her in dramatic fashion in 1975 when she announced she would attempt to brave the currents of New Zealand's Cook Strait. It's an arduous 16-mile swim and by the time she pulled herself to shore on the rocks of the South Island, the entire country, including the Prime Minister, was tracking her progress. Church bells pealed across New Zealand when she made it safely out of the water. Lynn Cox had found her mission in life. The most important idea that came out of it was that a swim could be more than an individual athletic challenge, she explained afterward. A swim could be a way to connect with people from different countries, and it could be a way to open borders between people. The Bering Sea Swim on August 7, 1987, took three decades to pull off. Not because of the near-freezing water temperatures, but because of the icy relations between the two superpowers on either side of the Bering Strait. On the Alaska side was Little Diomede Island. On the Siberian side was Big Diomede. The Ice Curtain, as locals called it, divided the two islands. No one, not even the Inuit people whose families lived on both islands, were allowed to travel from one to the other by boat. No human being had ever tried to swim it. Cox wore down Russian and American authorities by the sheer audacity of her request. What security threat could she pose in her bathing suit? Her trip finally approved, she set out on a day in which the cold sea was calm, but also covered by a thick fog, making it difficult to see. When she crossed the international date line, a journalist in one of the boats following her called out, It's tomorrow, which lightened the mood. Fifty yards from Big Diomede, Cox realized the closest rocks wouldn't suffice. A Russian welcoming party was on a beach half a mile away, which meant increasing her time in the water. The whole point of the swim, as she saw it, was to reach out to the Soviets, so, undaunted, she braved the worst stretch of the swim, and was pulled out of the water by welcoming Russian arms, wrapped in blankets and walked to a warming tent before attending a party on the beach. Among those impressed was Mikhail Gorbachev. Four months later he was at the White House to sign a historic treaty limiting intermediate-range missiles. 
At that ceremony, President Reagan paid homage to the Soviet leader by quoting a Russian proverb. The harvest comes more from sweat than from the dew. At dinner, it was Gorbachev's turn to offer a toast. Last summer it took one brave American by the name of Lynn Cox just two hours to swim from one of our countries to the other, Gorby said. We saw on television how sincere and friendly the meeting was between our people and the Americans when she stepped onto the Soviet shore. She proved by her courage how close to each other our peoples live Carl M. Cannon Washington Bureau Chief, Real Clear Politics at Carl Cannon Twitter, see Cannon at RealClearPolitics.com.